We're uh, finishing up Joshua today. I know we still have a long way to go in Joshua, but the end of Joshua is just like about give, you know, passing out the lands that, you know, through the promised land, uh, through the God's promise and, and covenant there. But I want to end with Joshua 10. And so far we have seen a lot of goodness, and we've also seen a lot of destruction that's come with, uh, in Joshua, in the book of Joshua. We've also seen obedience through Israel, and we've also seen a lot of self-pleasure through uh, with Israel. In Joshua, we, get, we see the uh, effectiveness of what it means to remain strong and courageous. Right? We saw that at the very beginning. God's command is like, hey, remain strong and courageous. And what happens when we lean into our own dependency rather than what happens when we lean into God's dependency, right? I've stated uh, so far that we have got two important and fundamental rules in following Christ from this book. Uh, that's the first one was uh, God, God's promises requires faith. And then the second uh, fundamental rule was that faith requires obedient living, both of which are extremely hard. But, but we can have the, some of the most rewarding moments as a Christian people if we decide to lay our personal agendas aside, our selfish desires down, and seek God. We have more to do than just sit back and say that we believe. There is more to do than just sit back and do nothing. We are called to love each other unconditionally. We are called to commune not only with God but with others. We are supposed to create relationships within our communities. And we are supposed to hold each other accountable, not judge others around us who don't follow a Christian lifestyle. When that happens, when we start judging others, you know, um, we're out of communion with God. When we don't engage in relationships with our community, we're out of communion with God. We're out of fellowship. We're not meditating on the word of God, and we're more prone to attacks from Satan at that point. And remember what I said that I think it was in Joshua 9 that Satan comes here to deceive us, right? And he does it openly, he does it blatantly, and he does it super subtly as well. The subtleness of his attacks are probably what's most concerning to me. Because we're, we are taken down a path that we're not needing to go down. We're, we, we take on new ideas that, that are contradictory to what the Bible teaches. And the, word, and the wording of it, it, it looks so enticing. And we begin to walk a path with Christ, be devoted to Christ. And, and then we are struck down, and this little voice in the back of our head um, begins to say, Ah, oh, it's okay. That one time isn't that bad, right? Or, ah, uh, they don't need the money. You do. You know, you you've work hard. You, you're a provider. This is yours. You earned it. Why put any extra effort into the Christian lifestyle? And all of this is exactly what drives us away from the promise of a future with Christ. And we begin to start uh, taking into our own hands rather than allowing God to work in our life. We become God. We would much rather see ourselves on, on a throne in our own kingdom rather than humbling ourselves and lay ourselves down at Christ's feet and serving God's kingdom. But yet, more times than not, we are the ones that are throwing shade. We're the ones that are denying people. We're the ones that are being bigots. We're the, we uh, become irate over something that Jesus uh, gave us an example of how to act. 
we're supposed to act with grace, with mercy, with compassion, unconditional love. So today in Joshua 10, we are going to finish up here. But before, uh, we're, we're going to see exactly what a bold faith looks like. What it means to have a bold faith. What strength and courage is. What it looks like to be obedient and allow God to work in us. What is our word for the year? Do anybody remember that? No. Man. Courage. What's that? It's been a long year. It's been a long year. Our word that we're praying at church here this year is courage. We're supposed to have courage. It took us, it took a, a, a huge amount of courage to buy this building. It took a huge amount of courage to, to just do the things that we're supposed to be doing. Shut down on the, when there's a fifth Sunday of a month to serve our community. It takes a lot of courage to do that. It takes me a lot of courage to have children in church on the fourth Sunday. It does, right? It took courage to move our service time to 10 o'clock. There's a lot. It it takes courage to step out of your comfort zone. But we have to let go and let God. Bold faith is hard. If our life is reflecting something other than than having a bold faith, then we have a, a bold faith, then we have a problem. Our life should be unexplainable because we have such a huge faith and trust in God. If our lifestyle shows anything other than that, it looks like everybody else's. It looks like the world's. And as, as long as our life is explainable, then our life is not believable. Does that make sense? The outside world is looking at us to see If there's anything different about our life that can't be explained apart from God. So we're going to cover some scripture today. And we're going to dig into some scripture that is unexplainable. (laughs) And that's a challenge for me because if you know where we're going, (laughs) it's a tough verse to cover. And it's my job as a pastor <clears throat> to explain scripture to you. Yeah? And I can't explain this one. <laughs> so, uh, Brad, you got yours coming up. I got mine right now. So, but what is important about this scripture is that I believe it. And I want you to believe it. I can't explain how this happened. I can't. I can only explain that it happened and that maybe why it happened, right? So Joshua 10, if you have your Bibles, we're going to start in verse 6. We're going to go through verse 14. If you have your Bibles, meet me there. If not, it's on the screen behind us. And it says, the Gibeonites then sent word to Joshua in the camp at Gagal. Do not abandon your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us. Help us, because all the Amorite kings from the hill country have joined forces against us. So Joshua marched up from Gagal with his entire army, including all the best fighting men. The Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid of them. I have given them into your hand. No one, no, not one of them will be able to uh, will be able to withstand you. After all night, after an all night march from Gagal, Joshua took them by surprise. The Lord threw them into confusion before Israel, so Joshua and the Israelites defeated them completely at Gibeon. Israel pursued them along the road going up to Beth Haran and cut them down all the way to uh, Azekah and uh, Makeda. Those are such hard words to pronounce. As they fled before Israel on the road down to Beth Haran to Azekah, the Lord hurled large hailstones down on them, and more, and more of them died from the hail than were killed by the swords of the Israelites. 
On the day the Lord gave, uh, gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, Son, stand still over Gibeon, and you, moon, over the valley of... Uh, I had this word earlier. Um, a, yeah, who cares? <laughs> Anybody? Help me out. Ajuan? Sure. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the nation avenged itself on its enemies, as is written in the book of Jashar. The sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. There has never been a day like it before or since, a day when the Lord uh, listened to a human being. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. Amen. So Joshua puts himself in this awkward situation, right, in, in chapter 9 of Joshua, and uh, by trusting in himself rather than God, right? He didn't seek counsel. And then he seems to learn from that in, in chapter 10. Would you agree? In chapter 10, we see a huge challenge that is put in front of him. It's an integrity challenge. Because Gibeon <laughs> was, was deceitful. They presented themselves outside of who they say they were, right? And they lied to Israel. And Israel signed this covenant with them, did a treaty with them, however you want to say it. And, and, and Israel swore to them that they would protect them from that point forward. And then we see... In chapter 10, the, the king of Jerusalem, at the very beginning of chapter 10, we see the king of Jerusalem get with five other kings, and they're like, hey, we're going to pounce on Gibeon because of what they have done, right? And so then this, the king of Jerusalem, the Amorites, and all of them get together, and they're going to storm Gibeon, and Gibeon's sitting there waving their hands in the air like they just don't care, right? And they're like, hey, we need your help. And they're screaming out for Israel to come and help them out. And there's like, hey, big guy, you remember our agreement? Yeah, I remember our agreement. Remember how we deceived you and forced you into this treaty? And now you had to come and help us out and make good on it. And so Joshua's response is, okay, we'll be there. And they went. It didn't matter how arrogant, how manipulative, how deceitful Gibeon was being. It doesn't matter at all. What matters is that they made good with it. They loved them unconditionally, right? It, it's kind of like us when we look to God, right? <laughs> hey, God, you remember? You called me by name, right? You remember you said you would never leave me or forsake me. Now you have to make good on that promise. I need your help. Sounds super familiar. Gibeon went to Israel asking for help, and they had the choice of not doing it and doing it. But Joshua said yes. So Joshua marched up, up in elevation, that's what it meant, to Gibeon, from Gagal to Gibeon, with his entire army overnight, by the way, to, to uh, fight alongside them. And, and along the way, God steps in, and he gives encouragement, and, the, and, and he comforts the nation through Joshua. And he tells them not to worry because he will fight the battle for them. In verse 8, it says, The Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid of them. I have given them into your hands. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. And as I read that, I think to myself, I'm like, man, it's very familiar. Because I've noticed people are more bold when... Somebody is willing to come alongside them and do something, 
Does that make sense? A person is more willing to sign up for, in my case, a race or any other challenge if a friend does it with me, right, or with, <laughs> with us. A child is more willing to go on a roller coaster ride if the parent is, more, is willing to go on it as well. And the same is, is true with us and God. We are more willing to fill, fulfill a task as people if we know that God is with us. God told Joshua he would go with them. God has told us that he will be with us wherever we go. And we see that in Hebrews. So no matter what the circumstance, God is willing to fight for us if we're doing what we're called to do. Right? And where we're called to do it. We don't have to fear. God confused the nations. We saw that. It wasn't Joshua that did it. It was God. Remember, you read it. It said that more people died from the hail than from the swords of the Israelites. He strengthened Israel to fight. Joshua is fighting, and the Lord is fighting. Yeah? Right. And the Lord is fighting through Joshua. And that's a great lesson for us. Because bold faith acts upon the promises of God. Amen? Amen. And God gave Joshua that promise. He said, hey, the outcome has already been, has been already predetermined, right? You're going to win this battle. Have faith in me. We can have confidence to fight our own battles. We have to, to make sure that we're going to fight the right battle, that we're fighting the right enemy, right? Again, Joshua is, is built up with confidence in God's promises. No man is going to stand against you. That's crazy. So as we're talking about faith this morning, as we're, we're talking about this bold, audacious faith, to stand against an enemy, we need to, first of all, hear the promises of God. We need to be assured of the word of God acting in us. We have to have the word saturate our mind and our life. And that's, this is how it works. We see it in the New Testament, and we understand, if you've read your Bible... Some of us have, some of us haven't. If we write our Bi or read our Bible in the New Testament, it says, we understand that faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ, right? So before we can act in faith, before we, we can charge hell's door with a water pistol or a squirt gun, we, we have to engage, and before we can engage with the enemy, right, we need to engage with Christ. We need to engage with the word of God. We have to make sure that we're being commissioned by God to do this. And, how, and so if we look at it first, we have to say faith comes from what? Hearing, right? So we, then we need to understand hearing is God's words. What uh, is what initiates faith? And without a word from God... All we're doing is wishful thinking. Then we have to pray. Right? We hear God's word. We have to pray. We have to pray God's word to activate our faith. Okay? And if you pray God's word, what you're saying is, God... <laughs> What you said is true. What you said by tr is true. And I, by faith, am going to believe what you said is true. So we, we have to hear God's word. We have to pray God's word to activate faith. 
then we have to obey. Then we have to obey. Obeying demonstrates faith. Yes? You can't tell me you have a bold faith if you just hear God's word and, and fill your, your head with an encyclopedia f of Bible scripture. Nobody cares about that, right? They want to see you take initiative. They want to see you love people unconditionally. I've had so much scripture thrown at me over my lifetime that it's unfair, right? People, and I'm like, cool, man. But what are you doing to help other people? What are you doing to, to, to commune with people in your community? What are you doing to love people unconditionally besides throw scripture at them? Again, if when you're met with that, when you're met with that, that scripture, and you're, it just throws up a blank wall. You, you're just like, meh. Scripture is good. I'm not saying that it's not, but we have to be careful, right? You can't just live. You have to be doers. We have to be doers. And so when we have faith and pray God's word, right, we want to make sure that we're praying according to God's will. So we, you know, in, in a lot of different churches, there's a lot of confusion about how can I pray in faith and exercise my faith in life, right? There's a lot of confusion around that. And so when I'm talking about this, please hear me, right? The will of God is found in the word of God. And there is never anything that God is going to ask you to do that he has not already spoken in his word. Okay? So if you read, if you read God's word and you're listening to what I'm saying today, you should be bending your ear to the spirit, right, to illuminate something spoken from the word of God. And, and you can be saying to yourself, how can I act and be obedient and faithful to God? The further that we move away from the written word, what happens? The less confidence that we have that it's from God. Yeah? Anything else that we have is just wishful thinking. In order to pray in faith on God, we have to have heard from God. I, if, if any of you guys know me, I have a very high view of the sovereignty of God. I believe God's will is unchangeable. How many of you here today believe that God does not need you? He doesn't need us, right? He can do anything he wants. He's not obligated to answer any of my prayers, yeah? He doesn't need me in a way, in any way, at all. God can do absolutely anything that he wants, completely set apart from us, right? Right? set apart from my own effort, he can do it all. You guys with me on that one? But then what do I see? I see this in myself, right? And I, I get deceived because I, I like to be tricked into thinking some stuff sometimes, right? We're all that way. And we see Joshua, right, and his will to march up to Gibeon to fight this battle, right? But then there's a other part of me is like, I don't need to march, right? I don't need to go and fight. I don't need to pray. If the Lord has got this battle under control, then I'm just going to sit here and like be still, right? I'm going to sit here the, on the sideline and, and cheer for God, like, woohoo, Right?
But we're not seeing that. We're not seeing that at all. God fought, but he also expected Joshua to fight. And God doesn't want us just sitting on a sideline doing nothing. We can't sit there and wait. He expects you and I to engage in battle. He expects us to have a vision of victory. Yes? He expects us to pray. What kind of prayers? Bold prayers. Bold prayers. And not engage him. And, uh, and to engage in battle and expect God is fighting through us and for us. We have to be able to, to do that. I believe that God can do absolutely anything that he wants to do. I believe that God is able to exercise his power. But then I struggle with if God actually wants to do that. And I get challenged from reading the Bible. Do you guys? Because we're met with scriptures that we're about to talk about, right? Joshua 10, 12 through 14. This is a difficult scripture. Would you guys agree? Can anybody here explain it? It says, on the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel. So the Lord speaks to Joshua. Joshua speaks back to the Lord. He was in communion with God at this point. Sun, stand still over Gibeon, and you, moon, over the valley of, uh, I, I, yes, Aijalon, Aijalon, Aijalon. Yep. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the nation avenged itself uh, till the nation avenged itself on its enemies as is written in the book of Jashar. The sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. There was never a day like it before or since, a day when the Lord listened to a human being, surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. How do we handle what is happening here? The sun stood still and the moon stopped. There's a lot of skeptics out there. You can go and do some research on this, right? And they're quick to point out that, they're, uh, that this evidence, right, in the, in the Bible is not true because it could, uh, contradicts science, right? After all, you know, we're in the 21st century, you know. The earth does what? Rotates around the sun. The earth is not the center of the universe, as many people thought. So the modern reader reads this, and there's a lot of questions that happen. Some people think that we're ignorant. But we must keep in mind that, that the Bible is an ancient source. It's very accurate. And Joshua was describing what he knew to be true based on sight. This is it. Anything other than that, they didn't have much technology, right, back then. So they didn't know which way the earth rotated or how it rotated. But what is true is that all truth is God's truth. We have nothing to fear from scientific uh, discovery or investigation. There's nothing to fear from that. Actually, what has been confirmed more than not is that the Bible is true. The accuracy of the scientific, of the word of God is true. Most scientists back in the day were Christians, which is awesome. We should be asking questions. We should be like, man, what in the world? How does this even happen? But the main point that we need to get from this, because we don't have all the answers and we never will, right? Correct? How old is the earth? Nobody knows. See how quiet you all are? 
Nobody knows. It could be millions of years old. It could be 6,000 years old. I don't know. And I don't have the answers. It's not what's important to my faith. Okay? But what I do know is that the sovereignty of God is in existence today. And it's in the life of all of his creation. That's it. Hands down. We don't know exactly how it happened, how the earth stopped spinning or slowed down or however we want to say it. But we have to believe it happened, and it teaches us this lesson, right? It teaches us this. God's answers, God answers impossible prayers. And what does it do? Changes impossible situations. He is fighting for us. Kids are going crazy. Have you ever felt like you're out of options in your life? Yes? This guy right here. Quite often struggling with that currently in my life. Have you ever felt like you were out of time and needed God to do a miracle to create more time? Yes. Yes is the answer. And here's the funny thing about this. When you're backed up against a wall, when you're hurting at your weakest point, it's not until you're out of options, when you're out of strength, when you're out of courage, you're out of money, that your prayers do what? Get bold. That's when your prayers get big. That's when your prayers get deep and meaningful. Does that make sense? Anybody who have prayed those prayers here? Yeah. I examine my prayer life at times, and most of it's just very surface, super surface. And it's not real bold. It's not real big. You know, we, we pray prayers like this. I wrote something down. Lord, lead, guide, and direct me. Yeah? <laughs> and whatever other sentiments that we can come up with to, to, to throw, <laughs> maybe throw God off or, or use it. Yeah. Anybody? Yes. There is some good truth behind that, okay? But God doesn't just want that. God wants bold prayers. Joshua prayed a bold prayer, right? That's crazy. And God's asking us, don't you guys ever like pray bold prayers? Come on now. Like I know where you're hurting at. I know where you're needing at. Like pray those, right? I, I know you need a new job. I know you need healing. Pray them. Why are we being so stubborn? God is everywhere. God is absolutely everywhere and in everything. And wherever you are, guess what? Where is he at? Right there next to you. We have to allow God into our situations. We have to. We have to give, it, give that over to him. And so, you know, we have prayed in my family for Amber's health quite often. And he'll either give it to us or he won't. I want my wife to have good health. And we've had many people around us pray for her healing, Okay. And we've met people who have been healed. We've met people who have been prayed over and have been healed, right? Have you guys ever witnessed that? If you haven't, it's, a, it's like a great experience. It is something unbelievable. Again, ha. you know, when God heals people like that over through prayer and whatnot, that's a great thing. We should be surrounding them and encouraging them. 
we should be celebrating with them. God healed them, right? But how many of us have ever prayed for somebody's healing and then they die? Yeah. And that's how it works sometimes. That doesn't mean that your faith is broken. It doesn't mean that your faith doesn't work. Sometimes God, sometimes God gives healing. And sometimes God gives peace and he gives trust. What we have to understand is God is not obligated to do anything. And that is the good news. I know it's hard for some of us to hear that. He doesn't have to do anything. And if God would, would listen to our prayer, and he has the ability to listen to, to prayers of all those who will cry out to him in impossible situations, what is keeping us from praying what is keeping us from praying? What is keeping us from asking God to do things that are big? What is keeping us from asking God to do stuff that is bold? I want a bold prayer life. It doesn't always happen. I want others to enjoy in that as well. I want us to become weak to the point of understanding. I want us to become so weak and broken that we have to rely on God rather than ourselves. It's exactly what we've seen Joshua and Israel do. When they've become weak, when they've become broken, and they've admitted that, and they've sought God, God answered them. But then what would happen? Do you remember? They turned into self Righteous, like they just wanted to be all about them. They wanted to take the reins and just go with it, yeah? They wanted to make decisions by themselves. They didn't want to seek God's counsel. They were self-pleasuring people, just as we all are. But that's where we have to break, our, that's what we have to break ourselves of, is becoming that type of person. We have to humble ourselves before God. We have to lay ourselves at God's feet and say, thank you, I need you. I need you to take control of my life. I need you to take control over my finances. Whatever your will is, God, let it be. I'm okay with what is going to happen because I have trust in you. That's a bold prayer. So as we're wrapping up here, here are a few steps that we can do to have a, a bold faith in our prayer life as we saw in Joshua. The first one is identify an impossible, it should be up on the screen. Um, it says, the first one, an, um, identify an impossible situation that you're facing right now. Okay? There it is. Bam. What's impossible? What's an impossible situation that you're facing in your life? I want you to write it down. I do. I really, really do. And then the second thing you need to do is write it out with specific wording. Specific prayers get specific answers. The reason why you, you can't point to any specific things in our prayer life is because we pray so broadly and generally. Target this impossible situation and identify it with specific wording. Yeah? Okay. Then the next thing we need to do is express confidence, our confidence to God, that he is able to move on our behalf. The next thing is verbalize your trust in God's goodness and in God's timing. What does that mean? 
Well, it could mean I'm not supposed to escape the situation that I'm currently in. I'm not supposed to sit on the sidelines. I'm supposed to keep marching. I'm supposed to fight. I'm supposed to keep doing what I'm supposed to do every day, every opportunity that I have. And then the last thing is thank God for his answer. But he hasn't answered my prayers yet. Yeah? Have we heard that? I know I have. Thank him anyway. God, I know that you're going to pull me through this. Whatever the situation is, I thank you for that. That's super easy. Thank him in faith that he's going to, he's going to follow through. And don't just thank him for the answer, but thank him for the patience that he's providing you while you're waiting. So, as the band move forward, moves forward, we're going to get into some worship. We're going to have time of response. If you guys need prayer during worship, I would love to be able to pray for you. I'll sit right up here, or right here. Um, I'm sure Miss Margaret would love to pray for you. I'm sure other people would love to pray for you. Donna, Amber, Lacey. There's all other kinds of people in here that can know how to pray. But if you guys would bow your head and take this time and think about what it means for you to have bold faith, turn situations over to God.